So basically the player plays a character who's been exiled from their homeland. They've committed a crime, which varies depending on their character class, and have been exiled to the world of Ryklast, which is a very hostile, forbidding continent. The Everything, ranging from the monsters to the environment to other players, are out to get them here, and they have to forge their way in this world. But we stress it isn't about the player saving the world. In this case, they're trying to save themselves and to gain tools that allow them to survive against the wilderness. Greetings gamers, I'm Gav. This is the story of Grinding Gear Games and the creation of their amazing title, Path of Exile. From Chris Wilson's garage to where they are today, GGG's consistent communication and openness with the community regarding their development set a new standard in the space. A connection between the player and the developer that's unfortunately been lost over time in many genres and titles. They do right by the fans of their game and are constantly delivering fantastic content. Officially announced in 2010, Path of Exile has continued growing its dedicated player base year over year ever since. In this video, I'll start from the very beginning when the studio and game were first being established, all the way to the successful launch of their game in 2013. I won't be going over every patch or how the game has evolved over the years, but perhaps in a future video we can take a look at the patch by patch progression of the game. I'll list off what I think are the top three major contributors to Path of Exile's long-term success, and at the end of the video we'll take a brief look at how they're bringing over a decade of experience into their highly anticipated sequel, Path of Exile 2 which is set to release in early access later this year. All right, let's venture all the way back to the beginning and dive in. At the age of five in the mid-1980s, a young Chris Wilson stared longingly at the new Amiga 500 computer system that his parents had brought home. He was still a bit young and his parents were apprehensive about allowing Chris to use it just yet. Keeping the computer away from him, however, only sparked his curiosity further. By the age of seven, Chris had already started to program on that very same Amiga 500 system. His obsession had begun. Fast forward to Chris's teen years spent at Avondale College, a secondary school located in his hometown of Auckland, New Zealand. Let's, let's get to the history of the company. Chris. Yes, Jonathan, how and when did you guys first meet? So, at high school, there was this computer in the library that had a copy of Quick Basic installed on it. And that was kind of the, because they didn't have it in the computer labs, of course, because why would you do that? So I'd go there in the library at lunchtime to do some programming, and this is when I was like 16 or so. And so one time there's this kid on the computer, and I'm like, hey, kind of, you know, so you, 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 <laughs> so I introduced myself when we were chatting, he was a few years younger than me, and so we started talking about coding, and um, kept in touch pretty well as I went to university, then he went a few years later, and we were good friends, and eventually decided that once we get out of university, we're going to go make a game, we weren't sure what it was yet, and um, I think we had a vague idea, we, we, we had ideas, <laughs> but it was, was it inspiration for that game at all, <laughs> yeah, a little bit, but we both played a lot of D2 together. Um, so, you know, by the time Jonathan had finished university, we were pretty set on this idea that everyone was terrible at making action RPGs and we could actually make a good one, which is hubris and crazy when you're just a couple of random guys in your very early 20s. I think you were like 20 years old uh, yeah, 20 at the time. Years, yeah. We hadn't had commercial game development experience. We were just hobbyists, like way less qualified than most of the people we hire now. Jonathan and Chris were fast friends with a shared dream of making a game together. This was much more preferable to them than making a career out of the mundane software industry at the time. Through their love of Diablo 2, Jonathan and Chris would find the next piece of their puzzle by pure happenstance. They found their art director, Eric Olofsson. Eric, how and when did you join this ragtag couple of guys? Well, so first of all, I actually met Chris in a Diablo 2 strategy forum, so that would be uh -huh. maybe Look around year, year, year 2000 or so. <laughs> so that was back in the day. It was harder to find out the, like, the best builds and so on. You didn't have streamers and everything back then. Mm -hmm. uh, but then a few years after that, I got a, a random message where Chris was saying that him and Jonathan were thinking about or like wanted to make a Diablo-like game, and that sounded amazing, I thought, so... And for context, you were living in Sweden at the time, Oh, right? yeah, so I'm on the opposite side of the world. Yeah, uh, literally about as far as you can go. I think yeah. we needed an artist, and we knew no one who's ever drawn anything in their lives, and Eric is an accomplished artist and has done a whole, a whole industrial design thing. He wrote a textbook that many universities use. Like, he's, he's, he's up there. And so I said to him, where would we find a lead artist? And he looked at plane tickets. The Trinity was formed. Chris Wilson with his vision for the next great ARPG to fill the gap they saw in the market and scratch that eternal Diablo 2 itch. 
Jonathan Rogers, who knew from a very young age that he wanted nothing more than to make video games, and was completely on board with the project. And last but not least, Eric Olofsson, the man behind the art and aesthetic of the game. Now what they needed was funding to make this vision a reality. Unfortunately, at the time in New Zealand, the games industry was still very underdeveloped, making investors and funding difficult to obtain. We're lucky to have rich friends, so they've been willing to invest some money in the project to see it to fruition. It's very difficult to get venture capitalists or angel investors interested, especially in online games. There's a mixture of fear and misunderstanding in the industry. That's where their fourth co-founder came in. That rich friend was none other than Brian Weissman. Weissman lives in the United States, and he privately funded the project's early development as its executive producer. Believing in the vision that Chris Wilson and the others had brought forth, Brian was a pro Magic the Gathering player from 1994 to 1999. For all you MTG fans out there, he invented the most well-known control deck in all of Magic history, simply known as the deck. I met Brian in the early 2000s because we both played uh, online role-playing games and we, at the time we were playing a game called Diablo 2, a very formative game, and that resulted in a close friendship which has endured to this day. And one interesting thing kept reappearing in our conversations over and over again. Could we in fact make a game that would be a worthy sequel to Diablo 2? Crazy idea. Chris Wilson has an absolutely insane magic collection and I'll have a video linked in the description for those interested. In the video, he shows off some of this collection of his, which contains some of the craziest Magic the Gathering misprints that I've ever seen. In late 2006, early 2007, the trio used Chris's garage as an office space. The first year, the guys did nothing but talk about the project and played games for further research, in an attempt to dissect what made different games so compelling, as well as meticulously going over the details of their company and laying out the foundations for their game. Back in the mid-2000s, my co-founders and I had played a ton of Diablo 2, like, like thousands and thousands and thousands of hours. And as we, over time, tired of the game, we looked at other action RPGs that we wanted to try out. You know, we tried out Dungeon Siege series and Titan Quest and so on. And we played those games too and enjoyed them, but only for dozens of hours rather than thousands of hours. And so this caused us to ask, why did we sink so much more time into Diablo 2? What was perfect? What made that game the best action RPG that had ever existed? And so we came up with a bunch of design pillars that we feel a perfect action RPG needs that some of the other games hadn't quite hit in all cases. Those design pillars are still used by Grinding Gear games today, albeit a bit more refined and expanded upon. Their unpaid research and development time that first year was well spent. Brian Weissman's funding aided in their ability to hire salaried workers and contractors, as well as rent out actual office space as the team grew. Their vision was starting to become a reality, and after much debate, the co-founders had finally decided on a company name, Grinding Gear Games. The name had a hidden double meaning which they thought was clever, and it fit perfectly. Grinding Gear Games stood for both the visual representation of the gears grinding together, as shown in their logo, but the name also exhibits the core gameplay loop of Path of Exile, which has you grinding for the best gear you can acquire. The small GGG team worked in secret for the next several years, not even publicizing the fact that they were making a game, not until what they had was ready to blow people's minds. In 2010, with Diablo 3 now announced and set to release in 2012, Chris and the team knew it was now or never to build hype for their game. The project was originally going to be called One With Nothing, a name which was scrapped in favor of the more epic title, Path of Exile. It was speculated that the name Path of Exile was inspired by this D2 expansion set, Lord of Destruction. And so, in September of 2010, they flew to the US to show the world what they had been working on. Grinding Gear Games and Path of Exile were completely unknown at the time, but the announcement of their game was a success. It was unique, and although not perfect, the game was well polished for its stage of development, 
and scratched that Diablo 2 itch for many players. Path of Exile received coverage in major publications at the time, including PC Gamer, Inc. Gamers, IGN, and more. Alpha and closed beta for the game ran from 2010 to 2013, and the team had scaled up from the original three all the way to 18 employees and contractors, looking to see the project through. The open beta was launched and the team was on top of the world. Things were going well for the indie developer, very well, achieving a peak of 70,000 concurrent users and nearly 2 million signups. Their initial growth was spectacular, but maintaining those players was the issue. As their small weekly patches shifted to large quarterly updates, they started to see a rise in returning and new players. These large content updates became known as Challenge Leagues, which would reset the economy and bring forth a ton of new content. Leagues and expansions allowed for both experimentation for future game mechanics, and also did its job in bringing players back fairly consistently every update. On October 23rd, 2013, Path of Exile was officially released. They named me Sinner. They stripped me of my life. But this land was a wealthy land. Bounty as plentiful as bones. There is a life here, if I have the will to take it. I will take from others. I will use others to take from this world. Or I will fight alone. I am an exile, condemned to live in fear. If I am to survive, I must do but one thing. the beast within. Grinding Gear Games had learned a lot of lessons through Alpha and Beta, and they had their fair share of ups and downs over the years to follow 1.0, but they've never lost sight of their original vision and have always remained authentic and transparent. Both the team's size and the content additions to the game have scaled up tremendously as the game has grown over the years. Let's go over the three things that I think have allowed Path of Exile and Grinding Gear Games to not only survive, but thrive. There are many more factors than the three that I'll be going over here, but I'm going to list off the top three things that I think have allowed the game to grow relatively consistently year over year. First up has to be their free-to-play business model. In 2006, when they were first laying out their foundational principles in Chris Wilson's garage, this one was near the top of their list. At the time of Path of Exile's inception, they would have been one of the first free-to-play Western games on the market. Uh, and you're using your own technology for the engine, correct? That's right, yeah. Right. It was written entirely in-house. Why'd, why'd you do that? It was cheaper. I mean, we, was it? We, we funded the game based on our savings and, you know, the savings of friends and family and stuff. So we had to take cheap, uh, I guess, smart options rather than buying tools because we just couldn't afford them. Economical? Yes, indeed. <laughs> well, we, where possible, we'll try, to, we'll try to think of a way which saves us money to, to solve a problem. Got it. Uh, and so why free to play in that case, so following up? When we started the project in 2006, there weren't any Western free games. It was popular um, in Asian markets, you know, games like Maple Story were doing really well. Mm -hmm. So we had this plan to be the first free-to-play game in Western markets. Then it took six years to make the game. <laughs> <laughs> so we were not the first. And since then, the term free-to-play has become poisoned a bit by games that sell advantage and experience potions and a ton of convenience options, which are almost cheating, if you see what I mean. Yes. So we've been very clear that while our game is free, we don't sell advantage in that way. And so... But this is something our fans actually really appreciate. Ethical microtransactions. That's right, yes. They knew that their monetization model would prove effective, but they were completely unaware at just how effective. It all started out as a crowdfunding program on their website. As funding grew thin for their beta development, they looked to the success of Kickstarter campaigns for other games. Kickstarter was riddled with fees that they didn't want to pay, so they decided to run their own variation of crowdfunding containing different backer tiers on their official Path of Exile website. The $10 tier contained a closed beta key, 
and the higher up you went, the more rewards you would receive. No pay to win, ever. The company raised over $2.5 million during this campaign, the early stages of what would later become supporter packs. These packs would contain physical items from the developers, such as t-shirts, mouse pads, decor, art, and otherwise. They would also contain some pretty exclusive and amazing in-game cosmetics. To add on to that, you would receive the monetary value of that supporter pack as store points to spend on anything of your choosing. For instance, a $100 supporter pack contains all of the merchant cosmetics that are listed, as well as a thousand in-game store points, which is the equivalent of the $100 that you just spent. They try very hard to cram value into these packs and they seem to get better every year. By allowing everyone to try your full game out for free, those that stick around and receive hundreds of hours of enjoyment out of the game actually want to help with the funding of continued development. It's a direct incentive, especially when the content updates have done nothing but increase in size and quality over the years. This free-to-play model that they've kept the entire time has been pivotal to grinding gear game success in my eyes. Zero barrier to entry. The second success factor would have to be their leagues and overall content release cadence. Chris Wilson likes to attribute the realization of this lesson to his now good friend and infamous gamer, Kriparian. The final story is one that I did not realize myself. I wish I was smart enough to think of this, but this actually came from Kriparian, the awesome streamer who played a lot of Path of Exile at the time. And so Kriparian and I were chatting on Skype, as I like to say that we did um, occasionally, and he said to me, you know what, Chris, I've got, I've got a lesson for you that really helped me as my, with my streaming. He said, every day I will wake up and I'll stream at a reliable time. I'm there right at that moment. And I'm going to stream until a predictable time. And then I'm going to work on my highlights video and I'm going to post that at a predictable time. And then I'm back tomorrow doing exactly the same thing. And I'm going to try not to take days off. I'm just going to stream at these times. And the reason he explained was because that way when someone comes, comes home from work and they're wanting to watch Kriparian, if that's the time of day that he's streaming, then they'll be able to watch him. And if they want to watch a video before they go to bed or whatever the timing is, it will be there. And the day that it's not there is the day they look on the internet and say, what will entertain me? What else is there in the world? And they'll find some other thing, maybe another streamer, maybe a TV show. And now that's the thing they're doing for entertainment. And he felt that his numbers dropped significantly if he deviated from his very rigid schedule. Now, you know, he's a powerhouse of streaming, right? He's, he's amazing. And he recommended that we do a similar schedule with Path of Exile because he, he said, look at your graph of what you've actually done in 2014. I, I made this graph, not him, but um, this is, it was all over the place, right? We've got medium leagues at 20 weeks, big ones at 16. They arbitrarily get small and close together. No Path of Exile player is gonna think anything other than, is that game dying? Like what's going on with them getting smaller and what's with the timing? No one can predict anything. And so he strongly suggested we have a rigid schedule because that way it's more convenient for him because then he knows when to stream it, but it's also convenient for everyone else. And so we tried this out. So this was our new schedule, the new era of leagues, as it's called. And so they're every 13 weeks. So this means exactly four of them fit into a year. That means that we know that they're going to be on the second weekend of the final month in each quarter or whatever we do. And this perfectly fits having one a few weeks before Christmas and a week before GDC and a week before E3. It just, just matches everything and it's great. So we started doing this and we were initially doing some pipelining. We work on a small one while working on a bigger one in the background. And then in the second part of the cycle, we release the big one and then repeat this. And that enabled us to experiment with scope and so on, because to the, at this point, we still weren't 100% sure how large these had to be to have the correct effect. We were pretty sure 13 weeks, which is roughly three months, was the right amount of time. During this game development conference talk, Chris continues to explain how players quitting your game is inevitable. Their goal was to ensure that with this new content release cycle and predictable schedule, that the players that did stop playing for whatever the reason may be, would have a plan to return for the following league, and that they would know reliably when the following league would be released. This content cycle has been working out very well for both GGG and the players ever since. And so when you look at it in the context of all of the Path of Exile history, you can see that we were clearly declining. There's no argument about that for the first few years and then really clearly climbing. They were clearly climbing indeed. And with their latest patch 3.25, Settlers of Kalgur, which was released on July 26th of this year, they continued that same growth trend. On the same day as the release of 3.25, the game exceeded its all-time peak on Steam with over 229,000 players online concurrently. And what some people neglect to remember is that Path of Exile has its own standalone client as well. And as long as they keep the quality and cadence consistent, I don't see that stopping anytime soon. My third and final, arguably most important factor is the community that they've built. The game was in development for over seven years. For at least four of those, Grinding Gear Games did no press or announcements for their game. No one knew about them or the game that they were creating. From the time Path of Exile was announced in 2010, 
Chris Wilson was extremely active on their website's forums. He made weekly dev blogs on their YouTube channel to update everyone on their development, and he was constantly involved on Reddit. Not only did this allow him to quite literally shape the community and keep the messaging of his company and game authentic, it was something the fans of the game really appreciated, and Chris really enjoyed it too. Between constant news updates, announcements, and otherwise, Chris earned the trust and respect of the players. And in 2014, Chris said if they raised over $25,000 for the Child's Play charity, that he would shave his head for the community. They did just that, and it was time for him to ascend to his true form. Hey, I'm Chris Wilson from Grandinga Games. Over the last couple of weeks, we raised over $25,000 for the Child's Play charity, and I promised I'd shave my head if we reached 25k, so let's go find a hairdresser, I guess. That same year, he also did the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. ALS is a horribly crippling disease, and it's a really serious business. I know it's funny to watch videos of people getting wet on YouTube, but you should seriously consider donating to the course. I've put a hundred bucks in, and hopefully you guys do as well. I'd like to nominate three people. Uh, first person is Max Schaefer from Runic Games. The second one is Mike Disquette from Five Live Studios. And finally, Sean from Bro Team Pill. Okay, well, we've got this nice and cold for quite a while now, so hit me, guys. Okay. <laughs> I need more cold resistance. <laughs> The game was really solidifying itself in the market, and the team was earning respect and admiration across the board. Chris and the team at Grinding Gear Games have not only built a fantastic game, they've handcrafted and curated an amazing community of fans. Fans that will follow them and support them until the end. There are a million more factors I could mention, such as their highly unique and versatile skill system, their passive tree, whether that terrifies or delights you, maps, items, and all of their meta systems and way more that I could list off and talk about, but I wanted to keep the length of this video relatively reasonable. I'd love to hear about what your favorite thing about Path of Exile is, and what keeps you coming back every league, if you'd be so kind to let me know down in the comments. Now let's wrap up this video and take a look at how Grinding Gear Games plan to carry forward this recipe for success in Path of Exile 2. Originally announced at ExileCon in 2019, Path of Exile 2 was meant to be a major content update to the original game. It was going to be the 4.0 patch. And we're really proud to finally reveal Path of Exile 4.0. The gods are dead. But left on their own, men will always seek to take their place. Criminals! Your sentence is to be hanged from the neck until dead. Let your souls feed the first ones, and your bodies feed the land. The only result is pain and death. This vision has changed a bit since then. Here's a portion of the keynote from ExileCon 2023. 
When we announced Path of Exile 2 at ExileCon 2019, we told you guys that we were releasing it as an expansion to POE 1 and that both campaigns would be playable on the same game client at a, at, with a shared end game. But POE 2's scope has continued to grow and grow, and it's far more than just an expansion with a new campaign. It has entirely new monsters, skills, mechanics, classes, everything you'd expect from the next generation of action RPGs. Not to mention revamps of most of the POE 1 League content. This thing is just freaking huge. There was a point where we realized that our plan to replace POE 1 with POE 2 would essentially be getting rid of a game that people love for no real reason. So we made a decision. Path of Exile 1 and 2 will be separate with their own mechanics, balance, end games, and leagues. But it's still a shared platform. Your microtransactions are available across both games. Everything you have ever purchased or will ever purchase in the future will be usable in both games unless it's hyper-specific to the content of one of them. You can't transform into a bear in POE 1, so a reskin of your bear form isn't going to work. But you absolutely can equip the awesome armor set that you got and use all your stash tabs. The separation wasn't well received initially after the announcement, but it truly was the right path forward. It removed any shackles that the original game would have placed on the design of Path of Exile 2 and both games will receive content updates that offset each other, so that you can constantly play Path of Exile 1 and then back to Path of Exile 2. Rinse and repeat. For those of you unsure who Mark Roberts, the man standing next to Jonathan is, he's affectionately referred to as Mark II since he was the second Mark to join the company, but most everyone else calls him Neon, and he's an absolute badass with an encyclopedic knowledge of the game. He competed in race events and on the ladder for fun, he plays the game a lot, and really knows his shit. Starting out as a simple QA tester on Path of Exile, Neon has proved himself an invaluable asset to the team, and I couldn't be happier that him and Jonathan are heading up this sequel project. I have to say, from the footage I've seen the past few years, Path of Exile 2 looks absolutely spectacular. As an avid MMO player, the WASD movement has me very excited, and just everything about the game seems so well thought out and polished. You can really see how much Grinding Gear Games and Path of Exile has evolved over the years. Path of Exile 2 is their opportunity to truly bring their new tech and all of those lessons learned forward, with early access open for everyone beginning in November of this year, barring any issues. When comparing Path of Exile 2 to other games on the market, I, like many others, find myself asking how on earth is this game free? Grinding Gear Games has achieved the impossible. Their continued growth can be attributed to a lot of strategy and luck, but the amount of hard work and passion that has been poured into this company and game cannot be understated. I personally began playing in Breach League myself and have returned off and on ever since. I absolutely can't wait for Path of Exile 2, and I'll definitely be covering it and maybe even the lore on this channel come November. Thank you so much for watching, I hope you all enjoyed. As always, for those that made it this far into the video, I have a question for you, and I'll respond to everyone that takes the time to comment their thoughts. What feature in Path of Exile 2 has you most excited? For me, it has to be the silky smooth WASD movement that I mentioned earlier. Putting that in an already epic ARPG, I absolutely can't wait. Like the video if you liked it, subscribe to my channel if you're looking forward to more reviews, documentaries, and lore out of me, and I'll see you all in the next one. Farewell.